Good afternoon. My name is Molly Martin and I'm with New America. I'm the director of New America's work in Indiana, uh, the director of New America Indianapolis in name. And I work in Indiana and a little bit in Arkansas, Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia, and Western New York. I'm really excited you're here today. I wanted to take a minute and tell you a little bit about who we are before we get to the far more interesting people on this call. Uh, I have lived in Indiana for 20 years. I've lived in Indianapolis. I'm from Southern West Virginia. I was drawn to New America because it's a different kind of think tank. And we are a think tank. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based in DC. Uh, but we do have folks who work across the country like I do because our goal is to solve social problems. And our goal is to highlight those who are already solving them in interesting ways. We know that we don't have all the answers. And we also knew that all of the answers didn't exist simply in DC. And that's why we're here. I'm really excited about the event today. At New America, we focus on issues of work, income, and economic inequity and opportunity, usually through a race conscious lens. We also talk about income and gender. Um, our working principles when we talk about race like we will today, uh, because the title of the series is COVID-19 and the Black Community. Um, our rules are Black voices are critical to communities' economic and cultural lives. Black lives matter. Race, race and ethnicity are different. Black residents are not a monolith. And we talk a lot about vulnerability, but that doesn't mean uh, that all Black residents are low income or all Black residents don't have means. Uh, one of the reasons I'm excited to do this work in Indianapolis is its story of the Black middle class and Black entrepreneurship. Um, black populations across the country are so different, but if you uh, recognize the trend in the communities I work in. Many of them have a long history of both vibrant Black communities and uh, deep segregation and sometimes deep, deep inequity. Uh, today we're going to talk specifically in this first part of our COVID-19 series about how Black communities get timely and accurate information. And you're going to hear from some top leaders. Now we only have an hour together and I'd, let, I'd love for you to hear far more from the top leaders. Uh, so we'll be taking time to have one-on-one -on -one recorded conversations with these leaders after the webinar so that you can continue the conversation and continue to learn more about them. Um, I will introduce the panel momentarily. I do wanna start by thanking them, but I'm gonna start with New America's lead partner in this work. Uh, and that is the Indianapolis Recorder. Uh, certainly, uh, if you live in Indy or if you live most anywhere, you've probably heard of the Recorder. And I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking to the editor, Oshia Boyd, uh, about the Recorder's legacy. Uh, so, Oshia, as I come over to you, I think Angela is going to unmute you there. Um, mm -hmm. I want to uh, talk to us about what the Recorder is, because we actually have attendees from across the country today. And then also tell me why you think having well-supported media by and for Black communities is so vital? Well, for um, those who know and those who don't know, well, first of all, thank you for this partnership. This is a great opportunity for us, for the recorder. We're a 125-year-old Black-owned newspaper. We have been Black-owned since the very beginning of 1895 when we started out as a two-page church bulletin. So we're the fourth oldest newspaper, Black-owned newspaper in the country. Um, I think that says a lot about the recorder. Um, we have been here for forever, it seems like, 125 years, and we're, we're, we are want to continue on with that legacy for another 125 more and 125 more. So what our mission is, is uh, preparing a conscious community. I think we've lost audio on Ashia. Can you guys hear me now? There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> where, did you, where did we leave off? <laughs> Um, could you uh, restart again about the importance of Black-owned media and, and media by and for the Black community? Thank you. So like I said, 125 years old. We started off with a two-page church bulletin. And so um, as, as you guys know, um, people are pretty aware that the need for uh, Black-owned institutions came about because we were excluded. We, didn't, we were not uh, considered part of the fabric of America. We had to start our own. And so we started our own newspaper to tell our stories, to, to keep our people updated on local and national news, as well as tell positive stories that were happening in our community. And that's still the role of reporter. We uh, still adhere to the highest standard of journalism. Uh, journalism excellency is our, is our standard always. Um, stories, uh, since I became the editor two years ago, our stories, we always look to engage, empower, and educate our readers. That's what we want to do with every story that we have in the paper. And sometimes entertain as well. 
but we want to make sure that we give our community good information that they can use to empower their lives, educate themselves, and be better citizens in our community. Fantastic. Oshia, research shows, and it's shown the same trend for, for decades, that Black Americans tend to trust local media more than their white counterparts. And it seems that Black-owned media and the legacy of Black community newspapers are a really important part of that. My guess is that right now in a time of crisis, the recorder gets all sorts of requests and demands on its time. Can you tell me what it's like to be this trusted scion of local media when your community is in crisis? What, what are you hearing? What are the sorts of calls you're getting? Oh gosh, it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> a lot of pressure to make sure that we are doing the job that we're supposed to do. One of my, one of my concerns is feeding into the hype, into the hysteria. I don't want to do that, but I want to make sure that we are disseminating accurate information. And, you know, that is changing so rapidly that what's accurate at one o'clock may not be accurate at two. <laughs> so that's one of our challenges, keeping up with um, what's going on and making sure our community um, knows. And with our website, that's reaching a younger audience. Um, as you're well aware that many of the baby boomers still read the print edition. So um, <laughs> we're a weekly, and so that makes it a little more difficult to get them the information that's changing every, every hour, every couple of days. So what we do with the print edition is try to make sure that we give them the stories that really um, will impact the information they need to know, the bigger stories. We're working on things like um, talking to businesses that have been hit hard, by, by COVID-19, um, talking to people who actually have, have had COVID-19 are in the process of healing. So we try to do some things differently for the print edition to make sure that people are still getting accurate information and good information. And then things like this also matter. Mm -hmm. And certainly we thought of the recorder um, as a really important community convener and, and thank you again for doing this. We'll be back to Oshia very soon uh, as part of our broad conversation. But next I'd like to turn to a special guest. We're really delighted today to have the Honorable Andre Carson representing the 7th Congressional District of Indiana joining us today to talk a little bit about the importance of amplifying and lifting up uh, good work in the Black community during a crisis, but also amplifying the challenges that are unique. Uh, we'd love to hear from the Congressman anytime, but I think especially at a time like now, uh, the leadership is much appreciated. Uh, so uh, Congressman, uh, Representative Carson, I have to remember all of my different etiquettes. Well, Representative Andre, Carson. Andre, <laughs> Andre uh, could I come over to you and, and ask you to say a little bit, uh, why do you think the COVID crisis might be different for Black Americans? Well, I, I, I think we know that uh, COVID has been damaging and devastating to our community and for folks across America and around the world. And, and there, there are really essentially two fronts to this. I think there's the, the, the public health crisis we're facing and you know, this, this virus is extremely contagious. Um, it's very dangerous. And our ultimate goal is to really slow the spread and save lives. And so while all of us are trying to engage in social distancing, um, and stay at home as much as possible, um, our economy effectively has been shut off. So you have restaurants, hotels, bars, retail stores, barbershops, dance studios, uh, yoga studios, gyms, practically every segment of our small business, minority, African-American, Latino sector has been impacted. And I think these social distancing measures um, were, were necessary, but it has wrought our economy and I think the impact will be so devastating. We're going to be talking about this for decades. And so I, I, I think that there's, there, there, there has to be this balance between making sure um, our community is a part of this effort to revitalize our economy, but you know, even I wrestled with, I had, I had a small business town hall yesterday on Instagram and I had some of, some of my, 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 my friends who are barbers and who own beauty shops and who are estheticians and, you know, some, some of my friends who even own smoke shops. 
and, and many of my friends who are entertainers, you know, I, I know Sean Jones is in here um, and, and Ashley and others, but even my friends who are entertainers are really, are really struggling and suffering right now. And as we are bailing out the airline industry and we're, we're bailing out other industries, small businesses are having to take loans. So you have big corporate enterprises who are getting bailouts, but small businesses are still having to effectively get into debt. Now, the SBA is, 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 is offering competitive interest rates, but we're still seeing an important segment of our society that is oftentimes overlooked and misrepresented um, having to get deeper in debt to solve this crisis. And it seems a bit unfair. So as a representative in the true sense, uh, one of the things that, that, that I have done and others on both sides of the aisle, quite frankly, because we all have constituents and I'm gonna have to jump off and get on a call with Speaker Pelosi in a few minutes, is raise these points with democratic leadership about how can we push back on the administration to not be so wedded to this idea of saving corporate interests, but missing out on everyday folks like us and business people who are the incubators of our society and who produce other businesses and who help employ over 50% of the population. You got a lot of nods on, on that one. <laughs> Thank you. When you think about getting the word out to these small business leaders, and actually next week's conversation in this series, we'll focus on, on small business and entrepreneurs and how they'll be impacted in the Black community. Um, getting them information quickly matters. Uh, getting accurate information in the hands of your constituents, your neighbors matters. What worries you about the trafficking of information at a time of crisis like this, especially in the Black community? Well, everyone's talking about um, this, you know, $1,200, uh, the additional $500 that, 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 that families will get. And it's a notable amount for many. It's a small amount for some, but I think it's, 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 it's an attempt to at least cover folks temporarily. But even if you work the numbers, if you have an individual making up to $75,000, or married couple making a combined income of about $150,000, you have an additional $500 for a uh, per child, that still won't be enough. And those payments even decrease very rapidly and stop altogether for single workers making more than $99,000. And so I, I, I still, you know, we, we, we've not figured out the right the right set of metrics to solve this thing. I think it's an honest attempt because we're still wrestling with trillions of dollars in terms of our deficit. But I, I would hope that we will continue to have these forms, one, for clarity and building bigger bridges between the government and, and, and the people who elect us, but also to kind of dispel myths right now because, you know, I. I there's so much information out there from, from health experts, from the president, and from um, uh, many of my friends um, um, who are very sincere and dedicated to enlightening um, the masses and, 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 and who are trying to keep us woke. Um, there is this confluence of information coming from all sides. And at some point, people don't know what to believe. Um, we don't, you know, people are at the point where they're unsure if it's bio warfare, uh, if, it's, if it's created by the U.S. government, if it was made in Wuhan, and you have all of these ports of information coming in, but what is clear is that it is devastating our economy, and Black people, particularly elderly Black folks and minorities and Latinos, are getting sicker and sicker. So regardless of the origin of this, which I think we should focus on at some point, I think what is clear is that our hospitals, our hospital workers, our healthcare workers are stretched very thinly. We don't have the resources that we need. The masks that are um, held in Indiana are outdated. And you, 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 you would think the wealthiest country in recorded history would be able to at least secure masks. Now we're having to rely on foreign entities um, to get the tools that we need while their own economies and their people are suffering as well. So we're at, we're at a crossroads, I think, where we're having to reevaluate uh, our misplaced priorities 
and this greater and more important conversation about healthcare and what it means in a free society. Well put. I, I think, Congressman, everyone on this call, on this panel, would, would agree and understand that there are systems in place in this country that have historically sure. disadvantaged all Black residents. Um, That's right. You know, to keep them from schooling or, or fair wages or safe housing. Yeah. This is a huge crisis that is amplifying those inequities. Yes. If you were to, make a, if you were to issue a cry, a battle cry to us all, <laughs> What would you want the panelists and the audience today to, to ask of people like you, to ask of the representatives at a moment of crisis uh, when, when these racial inequities are so heightened? What, what should we ask you back? You know, I, I, I think we have, you know, the, the, the press here, we have the NGO uh, representatives here, we have activists, we have artists here. Uh, my, my, my point would be to, to, to push us um, to ask the right questions, to do what's right on behalf of you and your families, but also to really inform us any information that you're getting and, and to really support healthcare workers and folks in the service industry. I, 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 again, it, with, with so much information coming in day by day um, on these conference calls, I, I think I have like six or seven conference calls a day, many of with members of Congress of different committees, and, you know, the experts who are on these calls are telling us that the virus uh, will, will, will peak and could possibly revisit us uh, much more deeply around the fall. But we certainly know that it's making a migration toward the Midwest. And to the best of our ability, while we can prepare, I think there, there has to be a point where we're working together cooperatively to not necessarily, or at least, uh, in a way that, that, that stirs fears and anxieties um, to focus on ways in which we can help flatten the curve and not necessarily deal with its root yet, but at least flatten the curve and practice social distancing and, and practice washing our hands. And to the degree that the healthcare experts are advising us to do, to, to do such a thing, I think when it comes to asking the right question, when it comes to contracting, uh, for vaccinations, when it comes to uh, minority vendors being a part of this and minority healthcare experts being a part of this greater conversation about doing work with the government and working with local hospitals as these federal dollars come to our states. I think that's an important point for everyone on this call to raise as we go further down the, down the road. Thank you so much. It's, it's hard for me to call you Andre because I was raised in Appalachia and my mother will like reconstitute herself from her ashes and say, you say, thank you, sir. And thank you, Representative Carson. Well, uh, everyone here calls me Andre Adre, so, and that's who I am, so. <laughs> well, thank you, Andre. We're really, really grateful that you could join us today. I know you have to hop onto another call, but thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So after that, which was a great mobilizing moment, asking for cooperative and personal action, we'll turn to our panel. I'm really excited today to have with us Alan Bacon, who is the Senior Director of the Social Innovation Fund at United Way of Central Indiana. Um, you've met Oshia Boyd, the editor of the Indianapolis Recorder and Indianapolis Minority Business Magazine. Uh, Ashley Gervitz, the Chief Executive Officer of the Alliance for Northeast Unification, and if I understood correctly, also an artist uh, and, and also an important part of our creative community. Uh, Sean Jones from WQRT, local activist, artist, and creator with Big Car Collaborative as well. Uh, speaking of Big Car, we have the Director of Programs and Exhibitions and also the co-founder, Shate Marsh. And then last but definitely not least, Latoya Pitts, the Executive Director at Krista Moore House. And, and thank you all so much for being part of this. Uh, so just to start off, since our focus today in this first part of the series is about how people in the Black community get their best information right now, I'm going to start, let's see, it's like looking at the Brady Bunch. I'm going to start with Alan uh, from United Way and ask you, in your experience with your neighbors, with the United Way stakeholders, how are people getting their information right now? And, and do you think they're getting accurate and timely information? Yeah, uh, thanks so, uh, so much for having me uh, on this panel. We're really glad to join the dialogue and conversation. But I, I think there's a, a lot of uh, modalities and ways that people are getting information. 
Uh, I think social media is definitely a driving force uh, in this as well. But um, I always, you know, direct people to uh, when it comes to COVID specific how it's impacting the nonprofit world. Um, uh, UWCI.org, uh, United Way's uh, uh, website is, is, is a place where I think that, you know, people can get accurate information when, when it comes to COVID, especially when it comes to the COVID uh, relief fund um, as well. Also, the Indie Chamber. Dot com. Indy Chamber has a great uh, program, a rapid response program that is uh, great for small businesses and uh, a catch all um, uh, website and uh, place for information is Kepper.org as well. It has a lot of information, a lot of uh, tools and, and, and resources that individuals uh, can access. So those are my, my, my main, uh, my, my three go to's when it comes to disseminating information. And Alan, that's so helpful. We'll make sure that we distribute that to everyone who's online, the, the list of great resources that you gave. Tell us a little bit more about the United Way's Community Relief Fund. Uh, it's, it was announced pretty recently. That's exciting news. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about, you know, rapid response and, and being able to um, get together just, just a host of funders. It's not just United Way, but uh, Lily is involved and uh, the Poem Center and Fairbanks and a lot of entities or just the funding community uh, has put together this COVID uh, uh, rapid you know, response and release fund um, so that we can, you know, help, you know, secure the safety net, help individuals in our community. And it's something that we're very proud of. Uh, we uh, were able to uh, get a lot of money out the door uh, rather quickly. Uh, which is uh, a goal and uh, something that, that we accomplished. And, and once again, it's really about, you know, how can we help support uh, the entire community, but also, you know, focusing on black and brown. So there's a lot of, um, you know, funding uh, that went to uh, nonprofits that directly impact uh, black and brown communities with Cafe at the Martin, Flannery House, Gleaners, uh, the Urban League, just, just to mention some. So I think that, you know, we're, we're doing uh, the best we can navigating this new space and uh, that uh, fund, uh, the COVID uh, relief fund is uh, our response to that. Do you think, Alan, since the United Way works with just about every health and human services agency in the, the region, what would you advise these agencies to do to reach the black community specifically? Well, I think it's, it's, you know, one, there's not a, there's, there's a lot of different sources of, of information. I mean, the recorder being, being one. So I think there are, you know, those, you know, pillars that the black community trusts for information during times like this, especially. Um, so I, I think that it's not necessarily a point of, you know, are we not getting information? I mean, people are getting information. I mean, places like recorder, you know, Kepra, there's a lot of grassroots organizations like Before You Fall, uh, that are going, you know, street to street, uh, canvassing uh, their you know, specific zip codes and areas that are doing a great job and make sure that the, the information is out there. But I think, you know, we have the right uh, pillars in place to make sure that, um, you know, we're effective in, in communicating with, with the Black community. Thank you, Alan. I, I will be back. I'm actually going to swing over to Shate. Shate, when, when all of this, when the crisis really hit, um, you and I had a, a conversation kind of back channel and you suggested that you were meeting people in your neighborhood who still didn't really know what was going on. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and reflect on why you think that is? Yeah, um, so when I was getting groceries there at Safeway, there, there were lots of people, you know, they're like, what's going on? Why, why is there no, why are people stocking up on toilet paper? And uh, why is there none of this available for me? Um, and they didn't know anything about what was going on at all. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, and, and definitely um, Alan just referenced it and, um, you know, Representative or Carson just or was talking about it, um, you know, is trust. Who do we trust um, in this time? Um, to get information and then who has access. Uh, um, you know, I think that, you know, the Indianapolis Recorder starting out as a church bulletin, you know, churches, you know, there's so many different ways now that, that we receive information and things are, are so divided based off of, you know, 
our histories and, and um, based off of, of race, like who do we trust within our communities to give us the correct information um, and who has access and then that's even divided within the, the communities. So um, I, I really think at times like this, um, you know, churches um, going door to door, that's the key to getting information out and, and making sure people have access to information. And um, because Big Car isn't just an arts organization, we were also have a foot in community development and community work. Um, you know, the, our space is a hybrid between a contemporary art museum and a community center. So we are thinking about, you know, how do we get information? How do we create spaces? And now, now that we can't offer up a physical space because it's not safe for people, how do we get information to people? Um, and, and, you know, continue our programming. That's really, really insightful, Shate, and, and I'll be back to you in a moment, but you mentioned the, the role of a community center, and we do have uh, Latoya here from Krista Moore House, and I think of all of the work that Krista Moore does in Hawville and, and on the west side, so, so you know probably better than anyone what it means to reach people kind of where they are on that day, whether they're young or, or old or starting again or in perfectly fine shape. And how do you build community and get information to people when you can't be more than six feet, you know, closer? Well, thank, that's a great question, Molly, and I'm so glad that you asked it. So um, with COVID-19, of course, we had to change how we structure and how we do business. So community centers have always been that place where you just walk in, and as soon as you walk in the door, you're greeted, we kind of meet you where you are and get you those resources. Um, another thing that community centers are responsible for is making sure that our neighborhoods and our families have access to the information and the resources that they need. And so with COVID-19, before COVID-19, we always have taken the Crystal Moore House um, and a lot of other community centers take a grassroots approach. And so that's going to where the people are. So we don't just um, use social media, which we do. We use a lot of social media, but we use a lot of printed materials as well. So our families hang out at Family Dollar. That's where they do a lot of their shopping at. So what do we do? We print flyers, we take them to Family Dollar. We're, we're making sure that the information is getting out there. Um, the gas stations. A lot of our families buy snacks and buy things from the gas station. So we're positioning ourselves so that we're in the areas where the families are coming to so that they can still get that information because a lot of our families, while they have cell phones and um, have access to social media, sometimes the public library, which we all know is closed right now because of COVID-19, it's how they get access to the internet. So if I'm a person that my email is attached to my phone and I don't have internet at home, the only way that I have access to this is the Marion County Public Library. But now that's not a, I don't have that access anymore. And so we have to get really creative as a group um, and how we reach our, um, you know, our, our, our people, how we get that information out. So social media is one way, but actually going out into the community. Um, Hallville neighborhood is fortunate enough to have a lot of um, advocates that are from our area who are still living in that area. We have a guy by the name of Ted Hardy who is on social media. He's actually going out and knocking on the residents' doors. We have our neighborhood association, Hallville Strong. And so kind of together, we're, we're taking a, a West Side Hallville approach. And a lot of the community centers on other sides of town are doing that as well. But I would say that's how we're getting the information out. Like you have to go to the people. Mm -hmm. Latoya, you make a really important point about smartphone access and broadband access. We know, and all, and everyone on this panel knows that uh, black households in America are more likely to be smartphone exclusive than white households. Um, some of that is trust, some of that is just income stratification, but you also have um, a broadband availability gap in black households. So you have maybe about 66% of black households with broadband at home versus like 79% in white communities. And so to your point, of public spaces, whether they're retail or, or third spaces, become increasingly important when people need information quickly. Um, how are you thinking about protecting your activists, your outreach coordinators, yourself, as you have to get creative and do kind of high touch person to person outreach for folks who don't have internet access right now? 
Yeah, so with Crystal Morehouse and um, IUPUI recently opened up their Wi-Fi and you can sit in their parking lots and have access to their Wi-Fi. So a lot of people may have not known that. Um, and the same thing with um, Westside Community Development Corporation and Crystal Morehouse. So we're not allowing folks into our building. My staff are wearing gloves, they're wearing masks when they're coming in contact with people. We're giving out pens, so we're not even recycling pens. So if a family comes in or comes to the building, they need to fill out paperwork outside of our building. You can just have the pen. We don't we don't need it back. We just we can't clean it quick enough. Take the pen. We'll just give the next family a new one. So we're doing things like that, like really getting creative. Like I never thought we would go through 2,000 pens, but here we are needing to order more ink pens because I mean you just don't know. So creative things like that. Um, but yeah, so that's how you know we're pro we're protecting our community activists. Uh, we moved to a model where not all of my staff are in the building at the same time. We're a small organization, and so we alternate days. So some days everybody's in the building and we're kind of in our own area. But like I said, we're using masks, we're cleaning off um, our surfaces, and we've restricted who um, is allowed into our building. So that's kind of how we're responding to it. But I mean, it's just like a, a kind of a doctor or a nurse, or like we're taking care of people's social um, needs, not necessarily their health needs. And so those needs still need to be met. Families still need to be fed. Um, utility bills still need to be paid. Um, and so those type of things, we don't have the luxury of saying, oh, well, we're just going to do everything from inside the building. It, it's just not that simple. So we just have to get super creative and make sure that we're taking care of everybody. Thank you for that. And, and that's incredibly helpful. A shout out to the public interest technologists who might be listening to this conversation. I think building uh, electronic intake and digital tools that don't exist right now, sometimes you have to do intake face to face and, and there are some challenges there. You know, one, one way that, that we reached people when we stopped being able to go door to door a while ago was radio. So this is a good segue for me to talk to Sean Jones. You know, radio is a really interesting medium at a time like this. Could you tell folks, especially folks who aren't familiar, a little bit about WQRT and then reflect to us, what's the mandate to a place like WQRT at a time like now? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you all for letting me uh, be a part of the conversation. Um, so, WQRT is a 100-watt 100 low-powered FM station a project of Big Car. Worked closely with Chate and, and company. Uh, started in 2017 uh, with the purpose of uh, serving the community, whether it be public service announcements, uh, volunteer-run shows, pretty much programming and, and shows that focus on stuff you don't traditionally hear on top 40 commercial radio. Um, so it's kind of an interesting moment in history. Um, I, I read an article the New York Times posted on Sunday about how community radio is getting more of a shine and spotlight um, more so now than, than ever just because we are kind of the beacon Bolton board for organizations and community members and folks uh, that don't necessarily have the means to get information from the World Wide Web or their smartphone. Um, so that's essentially what we're trying to do even more so uh, now is to kind of piggyback of what Alan was saying is get those pillars involved like the Kepras and Learning Tree Indianapolis Recorder, folks to collaborate with us to kind of just amplify that message, so to speak. And Sean, we don't know each other. So did you grow up yeah. in Indianapolis? Uh, I'm actually from Warsaw, Indiana, and I came to Indianapolis uh, for secondary education, IUPUI, and just kind of evolved into art and music and yeah. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, yeah, I'm glad having. to find someone from a smaller community. Yeah. So yeah. what's your reflection on the experience of getting information right now that is kind of by and for the black community in smaller Indiana towns. Do you have any reflection on, on that from having grown up in Warsaw? Uh, I mean, not, not really until I, I moved here and got to get to know my family, uh, my pops aside here. Uh, but I mean, the Indianapolis Recorder is definitely a staple at my granny's house. So, I've, you know, it was that was definitely a thing where I knew ingrained in my head that my uncle, my granny would always read the Indianapolis Recorder, and that was just an institution of, uh, of stability, you know. Uh, but that's, I feel like, is important now more so than ever, is to be able to share that, uh, th that with everyone, with the community and people that, you know, 
don't necessarily have the means uh, to, to touch technology like that. Oshia, when you hear Sean talk about the importance, uh, his understanding of the recorder as a trusted friend, you know, even in his earliest stage, everyone's mentioned it. You have a captive audience right now. Uh, Oshia, what sorts of support does a community media giant, but one that, that runs on a pretty thin operation, what sort of support do you need from the community right now? Well, the support we need, read, subscribe, go online, uh, subscribe. That's how we get advertisers based on subscription. Uh, go online, share our articles. That's how we get web advertisement because people see that people are actually reading our articles and sharing our articles. Our reporters work really, really hard. Um, we do a lot um, with the small staff we have. I'm always amazed at how quickly they turn stories around, just how in depth we can go um, with I mean, they're really pretty much straight out of college. Um, these are cub reporters, and they really do, they really work hard. We work, um, we work more than 40 hours a week around here. <laughs> and we also have a magazine, like you said, Indiana Business, Minority Business Magazine, which goes all over the state. Um, that's distributed statewide, so we do double duty. I'm the editor of both. They're the reporters for both. So we're always trying to make sure that we keep our community with good information. Um, that is just one of the things, like I said earlier, we're just tasked with. And it just warms my heart to hear people say, you know, your grandmother had the recorder institution. Um, that just, it warms my heart to hear that. When I hear people say how much the recorder played a role in their lives growing up. Um, I'm not from Indianapolis. I'm from Muncie. Um, but I used to hear the commercial on the radio. <laughs> and this is my second stint here, actually. I started as a reporter here back in the oh, early 2000s. <laughs> and so I came back. I came back after uh, some years away at other publications um, to be the editor. So that just shows, and there's a lot of people in our community who worked here and who are still involved, who still come back. They, they want to write. They want to help. They give us sources. So we are definitely family-oriented. I should say the community definitely feels like part of the family. So again, subscribe. <laughs> subscribe and buy ads. And, and uh, local media matters. I, I think we would all agree on that. It truly does. So, and I don't actually, think Yeah, it, it matters more than just about anything right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Ashley, coming over to you, you're with the Alliance for Northeast Unification. So when, when you weigh in, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about what, what that means, because uh, it may be a new organization to people. But since you work across community leaders, you work across business leaders and civic leaders and local leaders, you probably have some insight on what makes a good leader. I'm leading to something here, Ashley. Um, yeah. is is unfortunately kind of a unicorn. Only 6% of news directors in this country are Black. Um, we need black leaders in health organizations. We need black leaders in media organizations if we want black messaging and black stories to be told accurately and if we want people to trust those institutions. So, so after you tell us uh, after about the alliance, I'd love to hear your thoughts on developing black leaders to communicate at a time like this. Yes, um, thank you so much again for the opportunity. I would say first and foremost, uh, the Alliance for Northeast Unification um, simply is the collective community impact here within Northeast Indianapolis. Um, we are really grateful as an organization where it houses two umbrella entities, that of the United Northeast Community Development Corporation. So when we're thinking of uh, the bricks and sticks, our housing, uh, the community partners, whether you are a small business or a neighborhood association, all of those uh, play a, a huge impact as far as making sure uh, if we want to improve the quality of life in our neighborhood, activate the historical pres like preservance of just what makes a community community, we do so through that. Um, also with the Alliance, we house the Meadows Community Foundation. And we think about the business and economic development. Um, in our area itself, there were a time, um, was a time, excuse me, where our neighborhood was one no one wanted to invest in. There was no grocery store, the access to schools itself, but we know the power of what leadership can do together, uh, where for instance, today we're really able to say, 
uh, there was a $75 million investment in the early 2000s where there are schools. There is a beautiful health and wellness facility. So I think when we're leading into the question about what makes a good leader, it is identifying who are the leaders right within your backyard every single day. And in a time and period of what we're dealing with with COVID, we're seeing our, our beautiful, resilient leaders shining at such a major time of crisis. Um, who is that leader that has the ability of, I, as one of my neighbors remind me all the time, keeping it new school, but also old school. So making sure if we're communicating all important information, that it makes sure there is equitable access so it hits our senior. Um, and then it also means to being innovative enough of hitting our, our youth and our future generations to follow. I think secondly as well, a good leader understands the importance of we have our specific gift and ability. So during that time frame, our organization, we're small but mighty, but we know the power of our collaborative spirit of our community partners. Really thankful, for instance, as we're grappling, making changes, and I have to make sure I give credit where credit's due, um, this opened our eyes about how we were structuring getting information out. Uh, List Indianapolis, along with other community partners, helped make sure we had the essential needs of being able to integrate in um, information such as uh, text threads, um, a wonderful staple community church itself that feeds uh, with our, our populations and pantries um, hundreds upon hundreds each day get the adequate technology and even streaming to neighbors. Um, it's all done so through, I think, that aspect. One of the other things I think from a leadership perspective that should be thought about as well, you can't say you're leading unless you understand the components of what the people need. Um, it's so very important and essential that the characteristics, the concerns, the assets, the understandings, and yes, you will be tested along the line as far as how true to the leadership you will be uh, that you deliver. So that's one of the things uh, wholeheartedly, I'd say in Northeast Indianapolis, uh, we're doing and striving every single day. Um, and if it wasn't for our neighbors where we're just being that information hub for them, delivering, if that means their neighbors, whether block by block, are able to get critical tools to them, or is it their uh, businesses in our area where it's delivering information such as, you know, what was mentioned uh, with the emergency fund with UWCI, uh, and we have to look into like the rapid response Indy Chamber and so forth. Uh, we're just trying to do everything we can just to show we're standing with them during their most hardest times. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you for, for all of the work. You touched on a few things that are coming up in the questions and, and to our audience online, I want to reassure you, we'll make sure that your questions, if they don't get addressed live, get to uh, the folks in question, gets to, get to our friends at WFYI and we'll get those answers out. But a number of people have asked about credibility of language, trust in institutions. Uh, one of the programs that we'll do as part of this series later on is about uh, the Black experience with medical institutions and how it's not always so hot. Um, I'm gonna go down the line and come to all of you and ask, how do you decide how to differentiate your message for a black audience? Do you, do you talk to people? Do you have a go-to resource? Um, so yeah, how do you shape a message that is credible and takes into account the uniqueness and uh, of every black experience? There's so many different black experiences. Alan, I'm gonna come to you uh, since we haven't heard from you for in a minute. And, and ask you first. I mean, how, how do you shape the message? I mean, I think, you know, just from our vantage point, you know, the way we've been very intentional in reaching out to the black community. Um, you know, we've, we've funded entities like uh, Kepper and, and, and others. Uh, and we feel that, you know, we have a good um, understanding of, of what those needs are. But I think just, you know, from us, it's just that intentionality and you have to reach out, you have to go deep in the community, you have to have a level of understanding and that, you know, data and just what you collect should inform, you know, how you fund, who you fund, just what the strategies look like. So I think, you know, when it comes to uh, having that, you know, trusted source of information, you know, I feel pretty confident that, 
just from from our vantage point that you know we're doing the due diligence on the front end and just involving the right parties and having the right individuals at the table when it comes to uh, helping to decide uh, and inform our, our, our direction moving forward with our strategy and how we respond to COVID. Thank you. Shate, how about you? So, you know, one thing, you know, just being, just being um, multiracial myself and Sean and I both kind of struggle with always trusting like what our perceptions are of, of the black community. Um, I, a lot of times will go and, and like, for example, um, I work with Mari Evans or I work with people I trust, um, LaShonda Crowe Storm, um, Phyllis Boyd with Groundworks Indy. Um, and, you know, several times I, I'm asking, is this, is, is this right? What, what I'm trying to say, am I saying this the right way? Um, and also just not even speaking myself, but giving them the platform. Um, so I, I think that when it comes to messaging um, to specific communities, um, minority communities in particular, um, I mainly try to hang back and put forward um, people I feel in that community that are experts. Thank you, Shate. Latoya, what about you? What would you add? Um, I would just add, it's based on relationships. People listen to who they think they can trust. Um, we do a lot of non-sugar coating at Crystal Moore House. Um, we deal with a lot of um, brown families. And my situation is a little different. I was born and raised in Alville. So when my families come to the center, they she's from here. She's walked these same streets as a little child. She's grown up here. And so my my messaging is different. I'm perceived and received a little differently. Um, and they don't just look at me and think of my staff, oh, this is just another professional trying to tell me what's best for my life. Like they truly um, believe that I stand for what I stand for. So I think it's about building relationships, no matter what color you are, if you are talking to people and the people can tell that you care about them, you've done your research and you know how to speak to them on their level, on a level that they understand, not like you're talking at them, but you're truly talking to them, the people will listen. It's about relationship building. It's great, great advice. Sean, what about you? I mean, you're, you're kind of, you said you were new to town at one time, so you had to build those relationships from the ground up. When you're, when you're on the air or when you're finding folks to join you on the air, how do you think about the message? How do you think about the messenger? Oh, I think we're st you're still oh, muted. Man, I'm muted. Yeah. I'm you're good. good now. All right. I, I feel like I've been blessed to be in a community of folks that are so active within each neighborhoods all around the city, you know, from, you know, Learning Tree, Kepra, uh, even Ted Hardy. So you, you get a gauge of what folks are doing locally. Um, and you see people that are in the trenches that are on the ground floor being active and sharing a message that affects folks right here in the city. I feel like that is important to always be aware and listen and learn from that and to be able to share your resource and amplify that to let folks know that, hey, this is what's going on in Hallville over here. This is what's going on the Southeast side. Um, right now, more than, more than ever, I feel like it's, it's important to, to gauge and listen and get your information from folks that you trust you know, over the years and that you see are actively doing stuff from, you know, like the I, IPS, having the food drives or the Indy Parks Department have sharing stuff from work, Indy Workhorse, Workhouse Development, Workforce Development, stuff like that. Local ground grassroots initiatives that are benefiting people and rapidly right here in the city. Mm -hmm. Oshia, um, what would you add? I mean, you have to speak to so many audiences at once as an editor. <laughs> 
I, as everyone on the panel is speaking, I was just thinking about that is one of the challenges I have as editor of a newspaper is that we don't have one specific audience. As you said in the very beginning, of African, of African American community is not a monolith. So not only do we have descendants of slaves, we have uh, people who are born in Jamaica, who are born in countries in Africa, who all read the recorder. And so um, our experiences might not always be the same, but in America, we all tend to be told at one point in time or another that we are black. So I think that's where we can all connect is that we know at some point, no matter what we do, that somewhere down the road, someone will remind us, hey, you are black. And there are always challenges to being black. And I think that is one of the ways that the recorder, um, we always try to make sure our stories are told from a perspective of not necessarily downtrodden, but that we, um, we have a connection here. This country lets us know at some point in time they're going to try to put you in your place, whatever that place may be. Mm -hmm. um, and that we can rise above. We always want to make sure our story highlights um, challenges, but at the end of the day, we can still win. We can still come out on top. It's not a story of, of, of can't do. It's a story of we will do. We will triumph. And I think that's one of the ways we always try to make sure our audience, um, we, give them, we try to give them hope that even though things may look bleak, even though things may be this way, um, we've survived, we persevered. We've been here for 125 years. Um, how many newspapers can you can you say that about? Black owned, white owned, doesn't matter. How many businesses can you say that about? Um, so I think I think the record to me just um, it just actually exemplifies that that black excellence, that that perseverance, that can do no matter what mentality. And so I think we try to make sure that we we pass that on to our readers as well. Um, the connection is again. We are black owned. There's a trust there because we're black owned, but we're also taking a task. <laughs> People aren't always happy with the things we write, with the things we report. But but is it accurate? Is it true? That's that's the standard that's most important to me. Um, we try to make sure that we can stand by whatever we've written. And if we make a mistake, we correct it. I have no problem saying, hey, we messed up. We're going to run a correction to fix that. So I think that also earns people's trust when they know that we're going to uh, fix it when we do something, we make an error. So I think those things matter. Those little things matter. I get on the reporters, I'm like, you know, we, we, can't, we can't have a name misspelled. We can't, we can't use the wrong word here or there because those little things hurt our credibility. If you can't trust us with the small things, hey, can you trust us with the big things? You know, those are things that are very important to me. So obviously, Ashley, thank you, Oshia. Ashley, you have to build a lot of trust uh, with the folks that you work with in your project. Trust building, representation, uh, authenticity. What would you add when, when you're messaging? Oh, uh, you're still muted, Ashley? There you go. Um, you know, that's a great point. And just building off of what Ms. Boy said as far as trust, um, something I say all the time to multiple audiences um, throughout the neighborhood I work with is all progress moves at the speed of trust. We know that there are wonderful things that are here often at times, especially in our, our black and brown community, we're always seen for the challenges, the inequities, all of the negative things first, but we know for a fact that there are a lot of great assets right within our own backyard. So with trust, I think whoever the messenger is, it's important to make sure um, one has taken the time to know before a message needs to be delivered, that they know the audience of who they are delivering it to. So I think just any time, uh, whether it is through the relationship building with your neighbor uh, or community partner, that you do see that you have some type of connectivity with them. And so we have to take it from a multi-pronged approach. Um, some allow me to be direct with them. I'm a very open, transparent book. I don't mind admitting if I'm wrong. I think that also helps uh, with that trust building and the delivery of messages itself. But I also know too um, that it's important as well if a message may be interpreted and um, accepted, especially if you can benefit their life better, you know, who can I call on that may be able to help meet them in the same frequency so no one's left behind. 
One thing that really struck me about what you said, Ashley, and what everyone has said speaks to a, a really important question that we got about the concept of evidence-based decision-making. Um, when people who fund work or program work or decide what to put in the newspaper, you know, that he, this uh, audience member says, you know, that's an, an anomaly to black experience in life because it's been controlled by white voices for so long. And, and I think that's an excellent point. So the professor raises the point, I wanna say Professor Harold Brown, uh, raises the point, you know, how can we have trust in the truth offered about the description of us as citizens by a white voice? So when you think about adding more black voices to your own work, and, and a lot of you already do, um, what would your advice be to predominantly white institutions about adding those black voices? Things that they need to be careful of, um, tokenism, or things that they need to really think about, places they should look. Um, we're running a little close on time, um, so I'll, I'll probably take some of your answers offline and we'll make sure we, we cover those. But, you know, Alan, I'm actually looking at, at you because the United Way is a, a very storied institution. And, and how do you cope with making sure that there are enough black and brown voices in, in what, you know, a kind of longstanding white institution has been doing? Yeah, man, and I think, you know, honestly, uh, kudos to Indianapolis, because I mean, not just United Way, but there's other, you know, organizations as, as well that have um, been very intentional when it comes to making sure that black and brown are at the table, uh, when it comes to decision making, when it comes to uh, who we're funding and, and things of that nature. But, you know, we've been very intentional in making sure that we have a record of uh, the voice of our community and especially the individuals that we serve and a lot of the individuals that we serve in the community are black uh are black and brown people so uh it would be irresponsible of, of us not to have you know relationships with the urban league and, and chris morehouse and and, and kepper and, and flanner house and, and just things of that nature because that's that's our people that's who we're serving those, those are our neighbors so uh we make it is it's a part of our mission uh, internally and externally when it comes to our own uh, goals and outcomes when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. And uh, for us, I mean, it's, uh, it's just part of our uh, fabric uh, right now to make sure that, you know, we are doing our due diligence when it comes to making sure that the Black voices are heard uh, and just how that informs our decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Latoya, we had a question about myth busting, what local media outlets like the Indy Star are doing to bust some of the myths they're hearing, but you have grown up in the neighborhood that you now serve, you have deep relationships, what sorts of, like, are you doing the myth busting? Who's busting myths in the community about COVID-19 right now? Oh, I wish I was the only myth buster, but I'm not, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, that's the reality of what it is. It's a cultural issue sometimes. And so when I hear things um, that are not true or that are myths, um, I'm equipping my staff so that they can have those conversations, my case managers, um, my families when they come in. So the families that send their kids there for preschool and um, after school and our, our programs, our senior programs, we're, we're having those conversations so that they can go out and be myth busters throughout the community. Cause that's really what it is. So if I bust a myth for Miss Mary, and Miss Mary has a group of 15 friends in the same block with her. Now Miss Mary is the myth buster. So I've equipped her with what she needs to now be the new resource for the neighborhood. So I think it's about a, a game telephone. So if I bust one myth, then hopefully she gets it and I explain it in a way she understands it. And then she goes back and takes it to the masses of the people that she interacts with. But um, I mean, it, it, takes a, it takes a group. So my conversations with United Way, my other conversations with my other community centers, like, what are you hearing? This is what I'm hearing. Um, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, but no, I'm not the only myth buster in the Allville near West Side area. Thank you. That would be a lot, right? I think the whole world is dealing with myths 24-7. Um, looking at the clock and, and knowing that we had a very short window of time, we're actually coming to the end of our time together. I do want to acknowledge that we've had some tremendous questions and a lot of them speak to upcoming events in this series. Uh, we had a lot of questions about uh, institution and trust and Black experiences in seeking medical care, in being kind of believed, taken at their word and taken seriously when seeking medical care, developing Black leadership in healthcare, and certainly messaging about vaccine prevention and future responses to COVID as we learn them. So we'll definitely tackle those soon. We also had some really good questions about CDC, uh, Community Development Corporations for folks who live outside of this world, um, how they've kind of fluctuated in their size and their capacity, uh, what it takes to be successful there. And, and we'll certainly tackle that in a future program. 
Uh, and then uh, certainly last but not least, lots of questions about supporting individual uh, black business owners, getting information out to them. And, and that will be the topic of our time together next week. Uh, we will deal with all of these questions and make sure that we get back to everyone who registered and signed on. Uh, as we've come up on time, I really just wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much, Ashley and Alan and Sean and Shate and Latoya and Doshia. Uh, thank you to the office of Congressman Andre Carson. Uh, just tremendous thanks to Indianapolis Recorder for their partnership here and for the work that they continue to do. And, and thank all of you for tuning in to New America Today. You can learn more about our work at newamerica.org and certainly uh, subscribe to the Indianapolis Recorder. We'll share information about all the people and organizations we talked to today. But thank you so much. And Angela, I'll turn it back over to you to close us out. Thanks again so much for joining us and have a great day.